something for thee? What is it that the Lord would enable us to do? Thank you, Sharon. I appreciate so much the hymns that uh, she selects for us to be able to sing and the fact that she often uh, challenges us to try more songs, different songs and hymns that we can enjoy. Uh, yes, it is in the van. I left it there. I apologize for that. Yes, I did. We took two cars, and so her Bible's in this car, and so I apologize. It is there, but I forgot to bring it in. I apologize. <laughs> All right. Let's take our Bible, please, and turn to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2, as we continue working our way through uh, these epistles and uh, spending some time looking at what they have for us. 2 Peter, again, is an epistle written to really encourage believers who are facing pressures not just on the outside but on the inside matter of fact that is what second peter is about it is about really fortifying the believer against internal pressure internal uh attacks that are going to be there uh satan began very early to compromise the church that Jesus Christ left behind. Uh, how many remember the story of Ananias and Sapphira? The church there uh, was growing. The church was abounding in the the Lord was moving. In the were coming to spirit of uh, Christ-like love that was permeating the congregation, uh, and we we closed out. Uh, that chapter, I believe it was, where you have believers uh, coming together in such a tremendous way that uh, really they, everything was in common. Uh, it was not communism, uh, because communism is built around the government, uh, but it was a community of love in which it was built around the Spirit of Christ, and the Holy Spirit would then lay upon the hearts of the believers what they were to do with the things that they had. Was a beautiful thing but we come to the next chapter in the book of acts and we find that ananias and sapphira uh allowed themselves some tools of satan to bring hypocrisy into the church where it was not a genuine spirit-led movement but it was of the flesh to get attention to oneself without the sacrifice that comes with it and you know the story and the lord dealt very harshly with Ananias and Sapphira because of what they did. And uh, from that day till now, sought to infiltrate uh, the during the Apostle Paul shared the testimony that when he went back to Jerusalem, there were uh, some believers and there were some false believers, if you will, that had entered into the church in Jerusalem and they had begun to sow discord they began to try and interest. They were trying to make the case that you have to keep the law in order to also maintain your salvation. And of course, they were going to impose that, especially upon the Gentiles. And of course, the Apostle Paul resisted that, but it did, in, uh, uh, you know, it did infect uh, even the first church there in Jerusalem. So Satan has always sought to do that. We come to Second Peter chapter two and. And Peter is going to take an entire chapter, an entire chapter, and dedicate it to one thing. The theme of chapter 2 revolves around the traits of a twisted teacher. The traits of a twisted teacher. And so we're going to take some time to look at this chapter. Uh, there's a lot here. We're not going to be able to finish this chapter in one Sunday, but it really is going to be focusing upon how we can identify when there is an element within a church or an element within a leader in the church that is simply not right. I mean, Peter thought it important enough to dedicate under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit an entire chapter to this one subject. That is the whole thrust of that entire chapter. He's writing to Christians and he's warning them. But I find it interesting that he, he is building this chapter upon what he has just finished saying in chapter 1. In chapter 1, what has he just concluded with? He's concluded with 
the inspired word of God. He said, holy men of God spake as they were moved. No prophecy, he says, is of any private interpretation. In other words, what we are sharing with you is something that is common to all believers. That God wants all believers to have access to His truth and that no one has a, a, a monopoly on these things. And that the ones that were given responsibility to pen the Holy Scriptures were holy men of God that were guided in everything that they wrote down by the Holy Spirit so that what we have is indeed from the Lord. And so he's using this as a foundation. So really what we're thinking in terms of guarding against and being aware of twisted teachers, really the bottom line is adherence to the Scriptures and the focus of the Scriptures because Satan is wonderful at twisting even this but as we get into this chapter we're going to discover that there are certain characteristics that betray their their own fallacy their own uh, perversion and the fact that they are not what they pretend to be and I think he gives that to us not only because they were dealing with it then but I think he knows, well, I say he knows, the Holy Spirit knows, that as we get closer to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, we're going to be exposed to it even more and more and more. The Word of God indeed reminds us of two things. Christ reminds us that there shall come a, a, a falling away first. Well, Paul reminds the Thessalonians there will be a falling away first. And when he says a falling away, he's talking about those that profess to know the Lord. There's going to be an attrition rate within Christianity. But he also says that as we get closer, there are going to be those believers who are not going to be interested in sound doctrine. And they are the ones that are going to fall prey to these twisted teachers. So what are some of these traits? There, and you could stand with me as we just read a couple verses to start with here. And again, the message tonight. The Bible says in verse 1, But there were false prophets also among the people. He's, of course, speaking of his, Israel's history. Even as there shall be false teachers among you. That's a promise. Who privately, secretly, shall bring in damnable or destructive heresies even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways. Again, the word pernicious is destructive. It's the same word as damnable in the first verse. Same Greek word there. Their destructive ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. That is, of course, Satan's end game. If he can cloud the truth and cast disparagement upon the truth, he has accomplished his goal. And he has done a masterful job, especially among American Christians, in doing just that. Our Heavenly Father, I pray that You'd bless the time that we have in Your Word and Father, may our hearts be sensitive and open. Lord God, we realize that we live in the end times. We realize that we are living in days where Satan is doing everything he can to obscure the truth. And he has uh, for thousands of years manipulated even the Holy Word of God to seek to accomplish his own purposes and uses his own instruments and vessels. Uh, many of them are not even Christians preachers of the truth but sadly those that may even be christians but have for one reason or another begun to adulterate the truth so that the way of christ the way of the gospel is evil spoken of father i pray that we would be guilty of that i pray lord that we would be true adherents to your holy word and father that you would grant us spiritual discernment 
The same spiritual discernment that Peter exercised in discovering the, the hypocrisy of Ananias and Sapphira. To be able to see through the facade. To be able to identify the true believer and the true teacher of the Word of God. And Father, to adhere closely to that. And Father, we pray all of this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. What I'm going to do, my goal here as we go into this chapter, because as I mentioned, you begin in verse 1, and this goes all the way down to verse 22. The entire chapter is dedicated to this whole concept of twisted teachers and the damage that it does, a description of what they are like. And so evidently, Peter is very concerned that believers know what to look for to be able to identify the error, and not only the error, but the preacher, the purveyor of that error. And so that is why he's given us this entire chapter dedicated to this one particular subject. And so there's a lot in here. We're not going to cover everything, as I mentioned before. And then there's going to be little things along the way that we want to take time uh, to actually examine a little bit more closely. For example, there's one passage in here that I think is very pertinent. Are in this particular chapter here um, we, we take a look at verse 7 for example verse 7 and delivered just lot speaking of the Lord delivered just lot who was vexed uh, that word vexed there is to be oppressed to be worn down to be tired out because of the spiritual uh, evil all around him uh, with the filthy conversation lifestyles of the wicked and then in parentheses he says, for that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed. And it's interesting, while it's the same English word, it's actually a different Greek word. In, the, in verse 7, the concept of vexed is that he was oppressed. Uh, he was spiritually beat down by what was going on. But because he continued, it says he vexed himself. In other words, he, he, he actually committed spiritual masochism. The word is to be tortured. He literally tortured himself spiritually. He knew the vexation of a spiritual oppression around him, but he continued in it. He continued in it. And in so doing, he tortured him spiritually. He did not have to say God had to remove him forcefully. If you know the story, the angels finally grabbed a hold of him and said, you are coming with us. Because we cannot bring down God's judgment till you are gone. He had to physically remove Lot. It had so intertwined itself into his breakfast thinking to where he lost not just his own testimony. I'm kind of preaching another message here. We're going to have to come back to this. But he lost his own testimony so that his own sons-in-law did not think he was serious. His daughters committed evil with him and his wife became a pillar of salt um, all because he would not leave he would not leave the first thing I want us to note about these twisted teachers is their disingenuous nature they are disingenuous that disingenuous spirit uh, revealed to us in the first couple verses here. He says, but there were false prophets also. Uh, I think Peter is saying there is a pattern of this throughout human history. That whenever God establishes truth and lays it out there, Satan is very quick to try and adulterate it, to try and twist it, to try and turn it to his advantage. He began with that in the Garden of Eden. God says, this is the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You will not eat of that. The day you eat of that, thou die, you shall die. And Satan immediately began to add to and then question and then absolutely deny the words, Lord, you're not going to die. And he's not stopped. He's not stopped. From that day till this, he has always sought to bring an artificial element into everything. Truth itself truth itself is a threat to satan jesus christ said to the the people i believe it was john 8 he said you're the father of the devil 
He's a murderer and a liar. He is the father of lies. We go to Revelation. In Revelation chapters 21 and 22, we find three times a list of things that are not going to be three things that are not going or three lists of things that are not going to be in New Jerusalem. And that list changes a little bit. Certain components. There are all things that we consider as great sins. But there's one thing in every one of those lists. Only one thing shows up in all three lists. It's always the last thing. That which maketh a lie. Now, I think that's curious. I heard a, a journalist comment on something not long ago. I won't go into who it was or anything like that, but the journalist simply said, we are, we are living in a time when it doesn't matter what the subject is. If you tell the truth about the subject, even if it has no bearing whatsoever on the person hearing it, there is an animus toward it. Simply because it's true. It, it, it may not impact that person's life in any way, but it's true, and therefore it bothers them. And to me, it suggests that there is a spiritual component that is continually infiltrating our cultures around the world Paul warned us, he said, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. It's a spiritual warfare. And I, I don't think we really have ever grasped the significance of those words in Ephesians chapter 6. We, we tend to view it in a, in a kind of clinical way. Say, yes, we know that there's spiritual wickedness in high places. We need to be aware of that. But it is real. It has infiltrated our, the cultures of this world. And if Satan, as the father of lies, is behind all of it, and we know that lies are the antithesis to truth, then it stands to reason that anything that is truth is a threat to lie. So truth itself becomes a problem. And even if that truth has no bearing on somebody's life whatsoever, it, it's not bothering you to be true. But because it is true, I hate it. And they don't even realize it because they have bought into the father of lies. And I think it's going to get worse and worse and worse as we get closer to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is why as believers it is crucial that we stick closely as we can to the physical manifestation of the truth, God's word. It is here that we must live and die. We plant our flag on the Word of God. Because this is the truth. It is the written manifestation of the spiritual truth, which is Jesus Christ. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. This is the manifestation of that truth. In these two verses, we find that there is an artificiality being demonstrated in these verses here as there were false prophets among the people even as there will be false prophets among you they are not real they are artificial uh, the belief system that they have is not genuine they give lip service to it but it is not a genuine connection to it it is plastic you know Satan has always been a great counterfeiter, and sometimes, uh, particularly in American religion, if you will, the American religious experience, uh, we pride ourselves in being a little bit more open-minded, a little bit more uh, geared toward freedom, and so forth. A lot of the religions in other parts of the world don't float very well here. They have to adapt. They have to be uh, molded to, to really appeal. And so we have, for example, Catholicism. You can be a Christian and be a Catholic, but you are not a Catholic. You're not a Christian. Okay? So don't misunderstand. Catholicism. Based upon what you must do. It is worded this way. Jesus Christ opened the door, but you have to go through it. 
you have to through the sacraments and baptism being good catholic all these things you have to go through uh, what he has done for you whereas as a christian a true biblical christian christ has done it all we simply receive it by faith and he himself brings us into a relationship with the lord jesus christ with, with our heavenly father okay um, but sometimes you hear a catholic talk or uh, you say the same thing with mormonism uh, Mormonism, sometimes you could listen to somebody as, who is a, a professing Mormon and is embracing Mormonism, and you think, they're, they're a Christian. They're using all the same terms that I'm using. It's what they mean by those terms. It's their definitions behind those terms that is the problem. There is an artificiality about religion, and I'm just using a couple examples there. But in the world at large, there is religion, and religion presents or represents a, a plastic uh, facade of Christianity. And, and, Paul, and, and Peter says, listen, they did that back then. going to do it now, and they will continue to do it later on. And we live in a world of artificiality. And that is why it is important for us to know why we believe what we believe. Not just what we believe, but why we believe what we believe. It's another reason why during our Bible study hours here at Mount View at 10 o'clock, we try to really focus our energies, our attention upon sound doctrine. We cannot hear it enough. Peter himself, when he began this chapter, he says, you need to be reminded, you need to be reminded, you need to be reminded. I have to go over this, and I have to go over this, and I have to go over this. You know, I, I, I teach, as I mentioned, I teach grade school, and, uh, and, I, and I have found that you cannot just say one at one time. You have to say it, right, Grace? You have to say it many times. Go over it, and she's in my class. You go over it, and you go over it, and, you go, and even after you've gone over it and over and over, there's still those. That is part of our human nature, our human frailty. And now we're talking about not something that is physical. We're talking about something that is spiritual. And because it is spiritual, it brings a component that is more, I, I want to say complicated. It is not in that we have the Holy Spirit who is our because we have a carnal nature, a sin nature that rebels against it. So there's an artificiality in their belief, but there's also an artificiality in their allegiance. Notice what he says here. They shall bring in these things, these, these um, destructive heresies, these destructive doctrines, if you will. Uh, they are not doctrines that draw us in a holy lifestyle. They're, they are set upon humanism they're centered upon man and ultimately they deny the lord that bought them there's an artificiality about their allegiance to the lord jesus christ that is that is a hallmark of a twisted teacher their artificiality ultimately is exposed because it causes the hearer to downplay the significance of Jesus Christ. Man or the individual is lifted and Christ is lowered. That's fundamentally the, the reality that he's talking about. Whenever we come into a worship environment and Jesus Christ is pushed into the corner, and that can be so subtle, by the way. It can be so subtle. Because we could be singing about Jesus and we can be using His name, but the whole focus, the whole thrust is not really geared toward lifting Him up. It's about lifting me up. How I feel about this at this moment and what I want to be able to do and how I want to continue to live my life. And the holiness of Jesus Christ and His uniqueness is marginalized. But then he also says in the very next verse that they have a definite artificial testimony. He says, many shall follow their destructive or pernicious ways, and because of this, the way of truth shall be even spoken of. 
this world does not have, at least in America, by and large, this, this, this country does not have a very respectful view of fundamental Christianity. Now, part of that is expected because they're lost. They resent it. But I think part of it is also because we have not displayed Christ very effectively. We have not lived for Him in the way that He is worthy. And as a result, the world does not see anything significant about Christianity. They see that we are just as hypocritical, just as two-faced, just as selfish as everybody else. Why should we believe what you have? What you have makes no difference in your life, so why should we think it would make any difference in our life? And that is what the Apostle Peter is observing. Is that these teachers have a facade, a form of religiosity. They preach a message that seems to be biblical, if you will, but their life is modeled after themselves. So there's no real, there's no real uh, direction that says the Lord... He is God. And furthermore, because they are not even saved, quite frankly, as we look at this, you can't escape his observation that these individuals, these twisted teachers, are not Christians. They pose as Christians. They join in with the fellowship of the Christian. They know the vocabulary and the vernacular and they're very adept at saying the right things. But Peter says, beware. Because as you watch their lives, you're going to be able to notice some things. You're going to notice that they they invariably begin to supplant Jesus Christ with themselves. And it can be oh so subtle. They begin to live a life that begins to show itself it begins to be frayed their testimony is frayed around the edges at first you begin to see that they are not really what they pretend to be and as a result the way of jesus christ is maligned and evil spoken of they're simply disingenuine they are not what they pretend to be and sometimes it is very difficult to discern now we have to be careful here because god has not called us to sit in judgment upon one another. But, he has called us to be fruit inspectors. We cannot see the root, but we can see the fruit. So I cannot sit here and say that this person is not saved because he doesn't live the way I do and he says things I would never say and he goes places and does things that I would never do or go. Remember, when the Apostle Paul was castigating the church at Corinth, he never once said that they were lost. Now, we don't know what he was thinking, but he never once accused any of these that were guilty of pretty bad crimes as being lost. He simply said, you need to treat this brother as if he were lost. Okay? Even when he was warning Timothy about Hymenaeus and Alexander, he never said that they weren't saved. Matter of fact, he said of Alexander, I've turned him over to Satan that he might learn not to blaspheme. Well, if that's assuming that he's actually a Christian. Because you don't turn over Satan's kids to himself. They already belong to him. (laughs) But if they're the Lord's children, you can let Satan babysit them for a while and see how they like it. Satan is a lousy babysitter, you know. And that's what he was saying. I, I've turned him over. Ba- let, let Satan babysit him for a while. I'm tired of it. And maybe they'll learn their lesson. But getting back, getting back to our passage here, the Apostle Peter is cautioning, look at the fruit. What, what really is the upshot of their message, their testimony? Is there a genuineness that is there, that is focused upon Jesus Christ? Is is it true to the Holy Word of God? Does it line up? And and, you know, sometimes we may not be able to put our finger on it. Have you ever heard a preacher, maybe on TV, or maybe from, I hope never from this pulpit, but 
they say something is now we may be wrong but i i found many times i think the holy spirit says you know maybe not so fast if we're walking with the lord the holy spirit provides the instruction he's our tutor he's our schoolmaster he's the one that helps us to uh know when there is truth and when there is error and it may be it may be an honest mistake but the holy spirit says you know that's actually that's not true that's not true as christians we ask that we need to especially in these days say lord god teach me i want to know what the truth is i don't want to be led down the wrong path I know Satan has made himself an angel of light, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11, an angel of light, and that he is capable of infusing his ministers with that same deceptive quality, and they are disingenuine, but sometimes they seem like the real thing. The real thing. But they're what we might call spiritual bootleg. I want to be careful when I use that. Let's move on. Let's move on. The second thing that he points out, and this becomes a little bit more clear. As a matter of fact, the further you go into the passage, the obvious things become. And that's really the way it works. Um, true, uh, put it this way. Error, that which is false, that which is a lie, has no and because it has no foundation to it, it can only last as long as there is energy to support it. Artificial energy to support the lie. It must be propped up. And generally it comes in the form of more lies. You know, when there's a problem with this, just throw more lies into it to kind of keep it propped up. Truth can stand by itself because it comes from the one who stands alone, God. So truth will always stand. But in time, the lie is going to fall apart. It cannot continue. It will disintegrate on its own weight. It simply cannot support itself. And so as we go through this passage, we're going to find that Peter becomes more explicit in his description because I think that that is the natural pattern that is going to be evident by these twisted teachers. The second, second trait is their degeneracy. They're, they are disingenuine, but they also are degenerate. We're going to skip down because what he does in... Uh, in these the in interim passages or verses here he begins to uh, use illustrations and one of the illustrations of course is going to be of the angels that sinned all right he's going to talk about the demons those that followed after the lie of satan he's also going to interject the story of noah and the world the flood the worldwide flood and of course sodom and gomorrah where he introduces uh, lot as a part of that but if you Continue on down in verse 10, we begin to see some more descriptions of false teachers, but chiefly them that walk after the flesh. He's talking about those that he, God knows how to deliver the just out of temptation in verse 9, but reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. Again, that is terminology I think the Lord reserves for the lost. That is another reason why I don't believe that we're talking about just misguided souls here. We're talking about those that are not saved but are pretending. He says those that are going to be punished are those that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government. All right? He's going to describe these people really in four ways. He's going to, first of all, as very proud. If you look at verses 10 and 11, you see what I'm talking about. They despise government. That's the idea of despise authority. Okay, not just, you know, the government, the physical government. He's talking about they 
want no boundaries upon their life. They don't want authority telling them what to do. Uh, that is why many people do not like to go to fundamental Bible preaching. When you go to a fundamental Bible preaching church, you're going to hear a message that is geared toward this is what the Lord is saying that we need to do. And a lot of people don't like to be told what to do. Paul, again, he warned Timothy, they're going to heap to themselves teachers having itchy ears uh, that will feed their own lusts. In other words, I want to live my way. I want to go govern myself the way I want to be governed. I don't want the Lord telling me what to do. Now, they would never say that. They would never say that. What they do is they superimpose um, their resistance to God's authority upon the church or upon a pastor. And say, I don't want a pastor telling me what to do. Now, don't get me wrong. I have no right to tell you what to do per se. In and of myself, I have no authority. The only authority I have is what's found in the Scriptures. But they, but they, they do the end run. They, they say, I don't believe in organized religion. What they're basically saying without coming out and admitting it is I don't like God telling me what to do. I want to do my own thing. I don't like authority. And it... It doesn't fit with the way I want to live. And so I'm going to say I don't, don't, don't like organized religion. Well, we, I don't like organized religion either, actually. Mount View is not about organized religion. It's about the... How can we put this? It's not organized religion. It is orderly relationships. That is what Mount View Baptist Temple is trying to encourage. An orderly relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ predicated upon the Word of God. That is what we are about. That's what we want to accomplish in people's lives. But he's saying they are proud. They don't like the idea, the notion of anybody telling me what to do. And further, he says they are very carnal in their lifestyle. They are unclean. The lust of uncleanness is there. Uh, he, they, he talks about uh, a little bit later their uh, evil things that they do. They have a carnal nature about them. It is their lusts that they want to satisfy. And, you know, it is human nature not to be controlled. Satan himself, that's exactly what he lied to Eve about. He said, God wants to control you. You need to be able to control yourself. You need to be able to do your own thing. Don't let God bully you. And That was Satan's lie. And that is what these individuals seek. I don't want to be told what to do. I want to do what I want to do. And as a result, they follow the lust of their uncleanness and, uh, and continue. They're very self-centered because self-centeredness or willed nature uh, is always geared in that direction. He says they're self-willed. They're willful. They are stubborn. They say, this is what I want. Don't try to change me. It's, it's, a, it's a tragedy when we try to witness to people with the Gospel of Jesus Christ. And for no other reason other than I don't want to hear it. It bothers me. I want to do what I want to do. It is all about me. And that is the only reason they give. There is no real rationale behind it other than I just don't want to hear it. And there are those that fast be Christians that buy into that philosophy of life. And Paul says it's going to increase and Peter's making the observation that that's exactly what is going on in the churches there they're very decadent in their behavior going back to verse 10 um, they despise government they're presumptuous and self-willed they're afraid to speak evil of dignities and by dignities again we're not talking necessarily about earthly potentates and you know congressmen and presidents and kings we're not talking about that we're about spiritual powers and this even goes to um, Satan 
Satan qualifies as a dignity in this passage. Not that he's dignified, but that he is a powerful being. And even Michael, we are told, in the book of Jude, we are told that even Michael, it might be actually in 2 Peter, even Michael would not confront Satan in his own power. Not going to do it. And yet these people have no problem with making light of the spiritual forces at work in the world today. We are in a spiritual realm, whether we realize it or not. It's not one that necessarily can be felt. It can be at times, but it is nevertheless very real. Matter of fact, it is actually more real than the earthly environment that we find ourselves in today because it is going to last forever. So therefore, it is of greater importance. And he says that they have no problem with downplaying and and ignoring or making light of these spiritual things, whereas the angels, which are greater in power, might uh, bring not a railing accusation against them before the Lord. In other words, even the angel, and we use the example of Michael, which is done later, but he says, in general, uh, the angelic host uh, treads carefully in these areas, recognizing that they, as created beings, um, have no, no footing when it comes to the real, the real powers that are at play here. But these, and again he's speaking of the twisted teachers, as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not. They're, they're disrespectful, and this really is a third thought here. They are disrespectful, so they're disingenuine, they are, are degenerate, and they're disrespectful. The disrespect is based upon two things. Number one, it is, it is based upon uh, their, their sheer arrogance. They, they simply don't understand the significance of what is going on, and it's based upon their own ignorance. Ignorance and arrogance combined gives them this sense of pride and invincibility, and uh, ultimately, they shall perish in their own corruption. I, actually, I'm going to stop here because it brings me to another observation. He talks about these natural as being as natural brute beasts. And this is not just um, isolated here with Peter. Jude uses the same concept. As we get closer to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, we're going to see, I believe, an uptick, and we're seeing it now, an uptick in bestial behavior. Now, I'm not going to get into graphics here. I'm not interested in tantalizing and scintillating everything, but I am telling you this, that the further an individual drifts from God, the more he becomes like the natural realm around him, the beast, the, the beast within begins to hold more sway in his life. Again, I'm not trying to go in places that are not going to be edifying. I'm simply going to point out that I see, and you probably have seen as well, that when individuals resist God and say, I do not want to be considered in the image of God. I want nothing to do with God. I do not want to reckon myself as any any creation of God Himself in my own creation. I, I am what I am. They take, they take that phrase, God said, the I am. I am the great I am. And they say, that's, no, that's me. I am. And when they do that, they, they take, as it were, a, an astringent, they take, as it were, some strong chemical, spiritually speaking, and they continue to efface and erase the image of God in their life to where they become nothing more than the beasts of the field. They become 
animalistic in their, their interests, in their behavior, in their loves, or I should say their lusts and their, their passions. They began to emulate the animal, not the creation of God as made in the image of himself. That's the natural brute beasts. Again, I, I have to be careful here because I don't want to use too many graphic illustrations, but I've seen it where, where people, they want to be identified as a dog or a cat. And I'm not talking about just some Halloween silly costume. I'm talking about this is the way I'm going to identify myself. It is corrupt. It is, it is irrational. But it is a natural consequence when God's creation rises up in rebellion against God who created it. They lower themselves further and further and further into the bestial realm to where the image of God is virtually erased from their life. And they are nothing more than the beast of the field. I think probably... Probably the greatest illustration, biblical illustration of this, is found in the Old Testament. Can anybody tell me where we're going? Pardon me? Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar. I believe that that is a fantastical story, a true story. And I believe that the moral of that story provides insight into the life of of Nebuchadnezzar, the heart of Nebuchadnezzar. I personally believe Nebuchadnezzar will be in heaven. I think that we will see him there because he was given inspiration to actually pen a portion of the book of Daniel. All right? So I think that he's going to be there. But when we take a look at what he demonstrates here, his life demonstrates what happens when you push God so far off to the side. You become an animal. You become basically an animal. And when we tell generation after generation after generation there is no God, and generation after generation we feed them the lies that they are merely a, 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 an accident of chemical combustion. Of course, they don't bother to tell us where the chemicals came from, but we're just an accident. And then they wonder why they're uncontrollable. Why the generations that have come have no respect for law, they have no respect for parents, they have no respect for authority, they have no respect for life because they're animals. They've been treated like animals, they have been told they are animals, and so we should not wonder that they act like animals. And this is what Peter is saying, watch out. Because it's coming to a neighborhood near you. It's even infecting churches near us. It's coming. And as Christians, we need to be warned or warned against it and draw as close to the Lord Jesus Christ and His Word as we possibly can. Uh, and then we will also go into little elements of the message individually. But, um, Father, we thank you for your word. Bless as we close our service tonight. And the Spirit forward is not going to get easier or difficult. Thankfully, Father, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. You've given us the Holy Spirit to bear witness with our spirit that we are the sons and daughters of God. And you've given us your word to be a light unto our feet and a light unto our path. And Lord God, I pray that we would be able to adhere to the word of God by grace, your grace uh, working through us. And Father, that we would be a light in an increasingly dark place. Lord, may we not be fooled. May we not be uh, led down the primrose path Satan would love for every believer to go down. That we would stay on the straight path. The one that is lined with the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That we might have, indeed, 
a testimony that stands pure and wholesome before those around us. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.